And we're live. Good evening and welcome to our virtual presentation of Annie and the Wolves with author Andromeda Romano Lax and moderator Gail Brandeis. Uh, this event includes a Q&A, so to submit a question, please use the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen. You can also vote for any questions you'd like our speakers uh, to answer tonight. Also, please consider supporting Roman's Bookstore by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book. Uh, just click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer's screen and it will take you to our website where you can complete your purchase. And Roman's Bookstore is the oldest independent bookstore in Southern California. So we appreciate any kind of support you can give us, whether it's purchasing books from us or um, boosting us on social media. Every, every little bit helps. And uh, with that said, let me briefly introduce our guests and then we can jump right into the talk. So Andromeda, Roma, Andromeda Romano Lax is the author of The Spanish Bow, a New York Times editor's choice. She also penned The Detour, Behave, and Plum Rains, which won the Sunburst Award for Excellence in Canadian Literature of the Fantastic. She is also a co-founder of 49 Writers, a statewide literary organization in Alaska. And joining her tonight in conversation is Gail Brandeis, who is the author of the book of the book of Dead Birds and Fruit Flesh: Seeds of Inspiration for Women Who Write. And with that said, I'm going to turn my camera off, and we're going to start to talk. Enjoy, everyone. Thank you. I wanted to thank yes, Romans thank first. Uh, I've I've uh, physically been done a reading in the Romans store years ago, so that makes it extra special for me. I, Gail, I bet you've done a lot of readings at Romans. I've done readings for just about every single book um, at Romans, including a virtual one here. Yeah. Um, I love Romans. It's a place that is very dear to my heart, and I'm so delighted to be doing this tonight with you. So yes, those thanks for having us, and thank you, Gail, for doing this with me. Gail and I share a background uh, through Antioch University Los Angeles MFA program, Gail was on the faculty while I was a student, and we know that uh, many people in the audience also have a connection to Antioch, and that makes us makes me very proud and happy. And I just want to thank everyone who's coming out tonight, because we all know that in this era, sometimes Zooms are getting a little old by this point. There's Zoom fatigue. You may be making dinner right now or multitasking, and we just appreciate any time you can spend with us. So thank you. Yes, yes. So now if I could explain a little bit about why I was extra excited to do, do this with Gail. And there's things that I did not know until we were pr preparing a little bit for this talk. Um, I think the first time I ever got a hint that you were interested in Annie Oakley, Gail, was I must have put a picture of Annie on Instagram. And you responded to that and made some mention of having Annie in your background. But I didn't understand quite how much. And I will just say to everyone out watching this, um, there's an Annie Oakley that some people know from the musicals and the movies. And then there's sort of the real Annie Oakley and then there's the Annie Oakley in my book. And so this will allow us to go from one to the other. But so Gail is actually giving me a gift because she has a background in Annie Oakley that I don't have. So go ahead and tell us, Gail. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, I have a background that I fell into very unexpectedly. Um, 15 years ago, I brought my daughter who I think was 12 at the time, to an audition um, for Annie Get Your Gun. She was doing a lot of community theater as a kid. And the assistant director came up to me and said, hey, mom, you know, we need more adults in this show. Why don't you audition? And at first, I thought, no way. I am not an actor. I'm not a singer. I'm a dancer. I have a lot of dance performance background, but not the other stuff. And so at first, I was going to say no. But then I thought, if I do this, I can write about it. Because yeah. when I, when I, you know, writing makes me braver, it helps me push myself out of my comfort zone. And so I threw myself into this audition thinking, you know, it could be an essay. And then much to my shock, got called for a callback. And then much to my shock, got the lead role. So I ended up playing Annie Oakley in this little community theater production of Annie Get Your Gun. Um, and it changed my life in so many ways. I'm actually wearing a dress from the production from 15 years ago that I had tracked down and pulled out of a bag just before this. <laughs> Put brought my Annie Oakley uh, lamp here. And um, 
Yeah, and that that experience changed my life. And I feel like Annie Oakley herself did because she had so much spunk, at least as I was introduced to her through the musical and through some research that I did about her. She, um, you know, she was very brave in so many ways and she made me more brave and helped me realize that I was capable of more than I thought I was because I never thought I could star in a musical. Oh, and I'm married to my co-star now, which was another way the, the she, show she, changed my life. That's amazing. Yeah, so married to your co-star. That's incredible. A nice romantic Annie Oakley story. <laughs> yeah, so I was so excited when I heard that you had written a book about Annie Oakley. And then when I had a chance to read it, I was so blown away by it. You helped me see Annie Oakley in such a new way. You helped me see storytelling in such a new way. The way you merge genre is so beautiful and masterful. And I'm excited to talk to you about that. Thank and, you, that's very kind, thank you. Oh my goodness, I'm just, yeah, I, I love the book so much. Well, so, and that's the piece I love. So you use the word spunk. I'm sort, sort of curious because I didn't come into the Annie Oakley story. I wasn't interested in Annie Oakley when I was younger. That's not why I wrote the book. And so for me, those older movies and musicals seem a little cartoony. There's some aspects I don't like about them. And yet I know that there is that piece of them, that it was about a woman who could shoot and was independent. And what interested me was that in real life, she was actually way more amazing in my mind than the 1935, let's see, the first 1935 movie or the 1946 Ethel Merman. Uh, that was the Broadway musical. And then there was a 1950 movie. And um, but so I found that the real Annie Oakley was actually in some ways more, more, even more interesting. But clearly there's something about her. Why, why has she been an American icon this whole time? I mean, clearly she has meant different things to different people in different eras. And even the way her story has been kind of twisted actually reflects on those eras, I think, as mm. well. Yes, and you provide such a nuanced look at her life and such an innovative look at her life by delving into both the history of, you know, the real story and then taking it to this fresh place. And I wonder if you'd like to talk about just what drew you to Annie Oakley in the first place and what sparked this story for you. Sure, right, right, because for me it wasn't the musicals and the movie. So, so there's a complicated origin story here because it has two different parts, um, but that's sometimes how writing works, that you need the synthesis of different things to happen, and sometimes you need serendipity and all those other elements. So the first thing was that I happened to stumble across a footnote that um, Annie Oakley, when she was a child, was sent away for two years to live with a farm family, uh, and they abused her and uh, physically abused her, and it's possible that they sexually abused her as well. And they were supposed to provide her with an education and pay her, but they didn't do any of those things. And they restricted communications with her mother back home. She did have a mother. And with the infirmary couple that did have, were concerned about Annie, but they were, the, the, this couple was running interference. And so Annie Oakley only ever referred to them as the wolves. And so I read that footnote and just that little piece, just, just, it was so different from what I thought about this icon who seemed kind of cartoony, the fact that she had this uh, troubled background. And then, so obviously it wasn't just the fact that she was held captive. It was, I was wondering how that influenced the woman she became. Mm -hmm. So later in life, I mean, she was just this incredibly strong figure who was completely in charge of her brand in a way where she would be almost like a Taylor Swift or Dolly Parton of her day, um, in control of her career, happily married, um, but she was the major breadwinner and she had a very supportive husband, which is a wonderful romantic story as well, um, but she was really in control. But there, there do seem to be signs, and as soon as I started digging in, I found this, there did seem to be signs that maybe that early influence um, really shaped the woman she became. Um, she was also dedicated to training uh, other women to be able to uh, shoot firearms in order to defend themselves. And so part of me wonders if that was because of what she had experienced. Mm -hmm. um, she, she was not a feminist in the labeled conventional sense. She wasn't even pro-suffrage, but she um, believed that women could serve in the military. And she had actually written to the president and say, not only do I think women can carry arms and serve in the military, but I'm willing to be the one to train them, <laughs> which would have been a weird and radical concept at that time. Yeah. So there's, there's all of that Annie Oakley stuff that I was amazed by. 
but that alone would not have done it. Um, just coincidentally, around that same time, my father was dying. He was um, in Mexico where he had retired and we got the notification from some relatives and I had been out of touch with him since the age of uh, 13 or 14 when I found out that he had sexually abused my sisters, my older sisters. And so the relatives who did not know this, just know that we had lost contact and they didn't understand why, sent us word sort of, well, here's your last chance, thinking that we were the unkind children who had broken off contact. <sighs> yeah. And so at that time, m one of my sisters um, said, I'm thinking of paying him a visit, like going on a road trip to Mexico and possibly even with a gun. And I believe that she really was considering it. And I also felt like it was probably my duty to go along with. Um, and I think of that at the time, I think I was thinking of myself more as a witness, a translator, because I spoke some Spanish, <laughs> somebody to be there if this became just a just a crazy, you know, mess involving Mexican <laughs> jail cells and who knows what else. But I had really, as soon as there was that possibility, I had written the whole story in my head of what I thought would happen to my sister and what I thought would happen to me as the sister accompanying her. <laughs> And now, as it turns out, she didn't make that choice, and then he died, and that chapter was mostly closed, except for, except for the relatives who didn't believe us, who were not interested in knowing what had happened. So those are two very different things that all happen at the same time, discovering this American icon who was shaped, perhaps, by trauma, but clearly was resilient, <laughs> and then having a sibling who I believed had at least briefly considered revenge, and <laughs> about myself as bystander, witness, maybe accomplice. That's something I still think about now. Was I really considering doing something? And so only because all that came together, then I started writing Annie and the Wolves, which is the long story. <laughs> it's it's a, a wonderful story. Thank you for sharing that. It's so powerful that it comes from such a deep personal place, as well as you know this intriguing history and could you please read a bit from the oh, book? Oh, okay. Yeah, so we're going to do, we are both going to do some very short readings. And Gail, believe me, Gail has said, no, no, you can just read. But I would really like her to do a short reading. Mine will only take three minutes. Hers will only take a minute. But I would really love for the people who are here to understand the connection between the two books, why I really wanted Gail here tonight. Um, and I think you'll understand a little bit better when you hear from her work as well. So three minutes, very short. Uh, this is from the opening of the book, Chapter 1, Annie, 1901. She woke to the shriek of the whistle and the squeal of brakes. Three in the morning, yet the sleeper car was flooded with sparking, shuddering light. In that bright silver moment as the trains collided, she felt herself lifting from the bed, time slowing as it had always done at the bottom of a breath when she lined up a shot. She was floating, her gowned body surrounded by twinkling glass and feathers, every barb aglow. Then she slammed into the wall. A blast of pain raced across her pelvis and up her spine, too much to bear. Annie Oakley thought, away, and then she was. Annie was on her back, laid out on a piece of canvas within sight of the toppled train car, a wool blanket over the bottom half of her body. For the moment, no one attending to her. Turning her head, she could see other passengers from the demolished show train being escorted, limping and stunned, toward an upright stock car that had been turned into a makeshift hospital, its large panel doors open and dozens of people crowded inside. Other wood-sided cars had been reduced to splinters, their contents thrown into the swampy North Carolina lowlands alongside the tracks. Outside were cowboys, Indians, train crew, all trying to help. A bison from the show stood in a ditch unharmed, its massive, beautiful head turned toward her, backlit by the yellow dawn. The sun was rising, hours had passed, but it had not felt like time passing. She had skipped from the moment of the crash until now, like a stone across a pond. She rolled to one side and cried out in pain, attracting the attention of a man in a gray cap who was pointing a rifle at the head of a downed horse. The man hesitated and looked Annie's way while she stared past him, wanting to help the creature, but it was useless. Moving even a few inches had brought her to the edge of a blackout. The horse was on its side, on the ground, 
ribs moving with uneven, quivering breaths. The man settled his shoulders and aimed the rifle again. Pearly smoke, that burning, acrid smell, and her thought, no, but she knew it must be done and done well. Eyes closed, she listened and counted. Three shots, a pause, four more. She felt her anger rise. The placement must be exact for it to be merciful. It shouldn't take so many shots. She opened her eyes and saw the man step a little way down the tracks toward a second equally lame horse. It was one of her favorites, a dark chestnut with a white blaze down its face. This time, it was as if the rifle were being placed on her own forehead, the steel muzzle set between her own eyes. Skipping forward had been no reprieve. It had only brought her to the next terrible place. She closed her eyes, felt her heart slow. Again, she thought, away. And she was. Back on the train, just as the light filled the sleeper, just as everything turned a glimmering silvery white, she felt herself floating, falling, knowing. It is trauma that sends us away, but there is pain also where we land. <sighs> Gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Such a stunning opening. Thank you, Gail. I feel chills in my body, <laughs> even though I've read it and knew what to expect. I, I feel it. Oh. Okay, so now Gail is going to honor us with a short reading as well. Thank you. It's so kind and generous of you to ask me to do this during your book event, Andromeda. I, so I'll just read a very short piece, and I'll, I should let everyone know what this oh. book is about. Um, I have... Oh, yes. Yeah, I guess I have the advanced copy, so mine has the little ugly thing. On. Yeah, you have a better... It's a, it's a beautiful, absolutely beautiful cover. Yeah, it's, I love it's it. definitely a book you want to own. Yeah. Thank you. And this came about similarly to yours in that I saw a little something about Countess Bathory in a book that belonged to my daughter. She was interested in notorious women in history. I didn't I know. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a cool interest. She you know, pirates and all sorts of outlaws. And so I was just thumbing through these cool books and happened upon a chapter about. Countess Elizabeth Bathory, who was a countess around the turn of the 17th century in Hungary, and is thought to have murdered up to 650 girls and women. And I just couldn't stop thinking about these girls and women and wondering who they were and started writing poems in their voices, um, including- and most, in most of us, I mean, when I first heard about your book, I had to go to Wikipedia. Most of us have never heard of this woman. Countess, I mean, I, Countess Bathory, I still, I can't believe that somebody could have killed that many women and that we don't know. Yeah, about her. and so many people were complicit in it because she was, you know, uh, noble. And yeah, it was, it was horrible. And yeah, so this is just a little, <laughs> the first page in the voices of the ghosts of these girls and women. And I should say, when people do say they've heard about her, they say that they've heard that she bathed in the blood of her victims, but that's apocryphal. And so they're, they're saying that's not the case. They say she bathed in our blood. They say it brightened her complexion, our iron and salt scouring her skin of impurities, a bleach better than arsenic, or so you've heard, or so everyone's heard. You've imagined her body a luminous petal in all that crimson. Hundreds of us bled for her beauty. Scores of us drained so she could glow. If this were true, we wouldn't still hover here, still haunt. If our blood had seeped into her skin, we could have flowed directly into her heart, tried to dampen its vicious thirst. But our blood was ignored swabbed from marble floors, left to sink into hard-packed soil. Our blood, our dear and wasted blood, our blood has trapped us here. That's the first page. Thank you. So now those who are here from the beginning may have noticed that we kind of started light and now we've gone a little heavier. And Gail, I love the, 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 the plural we that opens that. 
and and we continue to hear from these victims and that's one of the many things i thought was amazing about this book that in the wrong hands it could have been a gratuitous violent depressing book about the sadistic countess and instead you've done something completely different which is give voice to all the victims and in and ha you have scenes that are just gorgeous. There was one I pointed Thank out you. before we started, which was about um, gathering toque grapes and the, how they taste like the gold is trapped in them. And so the experience of reading this book for me, um, I should also say, I'm not sure if you, if you said this, that it's a novel in poems. And for me, I don't read as much poetry as I should. And when I got the book in the mail, I sat down on the couch with no plan and I just read the whole thing in one sitting and it took about one hour. And I mentioned that because it was a very particular type of experience. For me, it felt more like watching a play. Like I, once I got in, the emotional content was really high and I just needed to stay in that world and come all the way out to the other side because it was, you know, could be potentially overwhelming, but then in the end it wasn't because of the way Gail handled the material. So it was this one hour, <laughs> You're welcome. This one hour amazing experience in a form that I would not necessarily have, I would never have chosen, and it's not something I normally read. And yet what you and I are both attempting to do is write about some very difficult things and needing to find the right form genre mm -hmm. approach for it. Yeah, and I love that both of us are finding a sort of hybrid genre with, with me. It was, you know, weaving together poetry and fiction. And with you, you've woven together historical fiction, which you've written so beautifully as itself in the past with books like Behave. And then you have, you know, the speculative aspects of this book, which, you know, you've you've delved into with Plum Rains, um, your, your award-winning speculative work. And so this, you know, this book so beautifully marries those two genres. And I would love and to so, know. So now you've done an interesting thing, Gail, where you make it sound purposeful. And we, <laughs> we want to talk to readers and writers out there who might wonder, do you have a grand plan, you know, a career plan, a book plan? And I will say no plan at all. And often <laughs> I really have to stumble my way into it. Um, this book for me was one, I don't know if you know this through our Antioch connection, but I actually started it more than 10 years earlier while I was a student, MFA student at Antioch. And it was a complete and utter failure um, because I tried to write it in a realistic vein I was using a lot of the autobiography, sending my character, who at that time was a writer, which is not the best way into a story, um, sending her on a road trip, which road trips are also, can be dangerous in fiction because they can get very boring. And again, just this autobiography, that, which was dwelling way too much in the real experience or the imagined experience of what I thought involving that revenge story with my sister and my father. Um, and so for me, I had to set the book aside for many years until I'd basically completely forgotten it pick it up again, and then only once it was really fun, allow in, when I was feeling more curious, allow in that fantastical element of time travel, which, and, and it's a spoiler, but there's a lot more in the book. Um, um, I had to actually try something different to make it work. And it was not because I thought in my career, oh, I've just done a speculative book, so now the bookstores will understand. In fact, I really had a hard time imagining this book ever getting published. Hmm. Which then brings me to another question with you. When you decided, okay, I'm gonna write this as poems, like what were you thinking about? Did you have any marketing ideas or did you think it would be hard to get published or how did you proceed? I try not to think about publishing in the early stages of a project. I just try to find my way into it and trust where it wants to take me. And um, so, yeah, when I started this, I thought it was maybe going to be five poems, just a little cycle of poems. Um, but then these girls and women just kept wanting me to give them voice. And it really felt like an act of justice to do so, to break this centuries long silence for them. And um, it just kept growing and it decided it wanted to be something longer. Um, at some point, all of them wanted to be prose poems. And so I rewrote them and then some of them wanted to have line breaks. And so it ended up this mishmash of, um, yeah, lineated poems and prose poems, some in the first person, some in the first person plural. Um, and did it was just ever, a matter. I'm sorry, I didn't. Oh, that's did okay. Ever, did you ever think of doing a straightforward historical novel at all? 
No, it, I, my agent at the time um, read this and he loved it, um, but agent. he felt like, but he, he felt like it should be the spine of a bigger book where there would be uh, more traditional storytelling about the Countess herself and then these ghostly voices would be threaded through. And that didn't interest me. Um, it, okay, so that gets at my question. So I said good agent, but so he really had a different vision than what Yeah, he had a different vision. And sadly, he's not my agent anymore. He quit to go back to being a librarian, but I have a wonderful new agent. I, they're both wonderful. Um, but um, yeah, and he gave me his blessing to just send it to small presses on my own since I, I told him it feels whole, it feels like what it wants to be. Um, I, did, I wasn't interested in the Countess. I was interested in these girls and women. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I didn't know that, but that really speaks a lot to, although you've said you don't pay attention to market, it's, it speaks to the pressures that can be out there to try to write something more conventionally. And one thing I have heard from my readers, my, my readers so far seem to fall into two camps. And one, one of the small camps is people that really want, uh, wanted a straightforward historical fiction novel, which this is absolutely not. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not sure I've made clear. So we have the Annie Oakley story, which is really coming to us, um, uh, from her when she's in her 40s. So it's not even the young Annie Oakley for a lot of the novels. She's a middle-aged Annie who has been in a train accident and has physical injuries. Um, but then I have a modern uh, contemporary uh, historian named Ruth who is trying to solve the mystery of this journal and letters. And then I have several other points of view as well. But so both of us agree that we don't write to the market and yet there are pressures out there. Like we know what the audience will more easily understand, what can be pitched, how they'll put it in the bookstore, whether it'll be adapted into a movie. I mean, I think of your story and I think in the wrong hands, this could become a movie, but not maybe not the movie you'd want it to be. Yeah, I, I actually, someone reached out to me to ask about whether the option was available, but nothing ever came of that. Um, but I, I am hoping that it will become a stage production. Oh, a nice. friend of mine adapted a portion of it into a staged reading for 20 Voices, which was my last public event last year before everything shut down. And it was such a powerful experience and she would like to adapt the whole thing, which is super exciting. And I love that idea. And I could see your book as a movie so easily. I could too, if anyone's out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh my gosh. Or, you know, a series, a TV series. Yes, fine. yes. Yeah, that would be fine. I'm curious to know how the character of Ruth came about. If you started with a, a writer, how did you end up with this wonderful historian, this complicated historian? I'm not sure, <laughs> which is not the answer you're supposed to give in, in interviews. <laughs> um, it was partly that putting aside the book, completely forgetting about it. And um, right when I set it aside, which would have been maybe around 2013, in frustration, I wrote several possible new openings where I changed who the main character was, just a couple pages in several different versions. And I, it occurred to me to try a historian instead of a writer, because a writer is very passive, whereas a historian, you can set them on a quest, you can give a sense of urgency. And, um, but I put these in a file, in a folder in my computer that's labeled like new fiction projects which is what I do when I don't want to commit. I don't even want to put a name to it. And I'm like, oh, I'm just pretending it doesn't matter. And then I put that aside. And it was only after I'd written two more books that then I happened to open up the file looking for I, I'll go and I'll read like four or five of my little what I call starts. And, and then I read this, this new first three pages with Ruth, the, the, Ruth, the historian, um, who herself has been in a car accident. So just as Annie Oakley has been in a train accident, Ruth is just at the, in the pits um, has has lost everything, um, has lost her fiance and has been had, had an unsuccessful dissertation. And now this journal arrives in the mail and and promises to be perhaps a way for her to get back into the Annie Oakley story. Um, but how did I come up with that? I have no idea. The strangest <laughs> part of the experience was reading those couple pages where she shows up at a high school, a teenager named Reese comes up to her that I don't remember inventing at all. Mm -hmm. And what was wonderful is that I didn't remember having written it at all, <laughs> amnesia, which can be very helpful. And the feeling it gave me was curiosity. I thought, I thought, oh my goodness, I clearly knew this was going somewhere. These two, Ruth and Reese, are going to head off on an adventure and they're going to solve this story. And they're also pulled toward each other for maybe supernatural ways, so especially that supernatural element where I thought, 
oh darn, I really had a plan and I just wish I remembered what it was. Um, so for me, amnesia helped, curiosity <laughs> helped and joy helped because mm -hmm. before that whole project had been contaminated, it was something that was not working, that I didn't have the skills and the, and the distance to make work. And I had to go do, write a bunch of other things and then come back to it with, it's easy to say beginner's mind, but it was, it was like, I'm just going to play with this. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's so awesome. And I love what it led you to, that, Thank you. that you were open to it taking you there. Uh, you know, it's just so interesting how we have these different parallels because I had set this project aside for many years as well. Um, when I started writing it, I was pregnant with my youngest son mm -hmm. and it felt like, you know, researching and writing about murder and torture um, maybe wasn't the most healthy thing to be doing whilst pregnant. So <laughs> I <laughs> I set it aside. And then, you know, when, when the baby was one week old, my mom took her own life and that that just consumed me and uh, that I knew that's what I had to write about because writing is just how I process things and try to make sense of my life. And so the next several years were spent working on my memoir, The Art of Misdiagnosis. Um, I had a really powerful- I say that's, that's one of my favorite memoirs. Oh my goodness, thank you. Yeah. I had such an intense reading at Romans from that book because it happened to be on the anniversary of my mom's death, like a mile away from where she died. And my sister came, um, so having her there was amazing. But um, so anyway, I, I, I wrote this memoir, which was the hardest, most necessary thing I'd ever written. And I know you've talked about this being the hardest book you've ever written, and I, I would love to talk yeah. more about that. And um, when I finished it, I felt so empty and I felt like nothing I ever write is ever going to be meaningful again because this was the most meaningful thing I'd ever written and I didn't know how anything would feel urgent again. And then I remembered this project I set aside with with these ghosts. And you know, like I said, I opened it up and there was life in it. And you know, all these years later I returned to it and it felt like a really good follow-up to my memoir because I felt like that had cracked me open to the pain of the world and I was ready to face it head on um, and deal with a bigger grief than my own. And, and you know, again, like, you know, it felt like an act of justice um, to, oh, to give voice. Um, so, yeah, so it, it took me a while to be able to, to return to it. And once I did, the rest of it, came out fairly quickly. It sort of burned its way out of me and then of course needed to be refined over a longer period of time. Yeah, same, um, same experience. I had the same experience where that first new draft after that long period of putting it away, that first next draft was quite quick, which I hope seems helpful to anyone who has put something in a drawer for about seven years. Yeah. Um, but did it feel, Gail, did it feel dark to you? I mean, you had just written a very dark book. You said it came alive, but did it feel too grim in any way? It didn't actually, it, it felt, um, I don't know, it certainly it, it is grim and parts of it were really hard to write because they were so brutal. Um, but it also, it felt like, you know, like I said, I didn't feel like I would feel urgency again. And I did, I felt this urgency, like even though they've been gone for so long, I felt like I just need to give them voice somehow. And so, like you said, just, you know, even though the, the difficult stuff is addressed, my focus was on them finding voice together, finding agency together. And, and it felt like that, that desire carried me forward. Exactly. There's a lightness and a wonder, an appreciation of the beauty of the world in all those other sections, which I think helps quite a bit. And you just talking about that actually made me think about my two different drafts and how this one, it has the two timelines, the historic and the modern, but there's also many more points of view, uh, POVs, I'm trying to say points of view for people that are not, you know, just taking workshops all the time, but points of view, there's many more points of view in this version, the final published version. The way you were saying that you needed to make room for all these voices, I think once I had distance from my own autobiography, then I wanted it to be about many more people so in my first draft, I never thought of having 
a teen, two teenage boys. I have two teenagers, two boys in the story. It's not only women in the story. And I don't think that would have come to me earlier. I think it became a bigger story about a community and about more different kinds of people. Yeah, it's so gorgeous. And I, I'm curious to know, with the autobiographical impulse, even though you moved toward characters very different from your own story, um, if if writing this book helped you change your relationship to your own story in any way? I think it did. And what's been the most surprising to me is that I've kept researching after the book was finished. So I actually, did, I was so worried about it being so so much of a straightforward Annie Oakley book <laughs> that, um, that after I'd done a certain amount of research on her, I set it aside. But then I was still curious even after the book was done. So I kept researching about her and I kept researching about the uh, psychology of revenge and found out some things that I didn't know that would have been very consoling to me early on. Mm -hmm. And so when my sister expressed just this idea of revenge and then it, it planted this whole story in my head, I still wasn't sure about is that healthy to have these uh, a revenge fantasy happening in your mind. And then later on, I heard a news story uh, on NPR that claimed that it's nearly universal and almost everyone has these revenge fantasies. And at the time, I so remember listening to that story because I thought, not me, I don't have any revenge fantasies, especially not the incredibly detailed ones they're talking about. So, so at that point, I still didn't recognize myself having sort of ideas of revenge, even though clearly I was inventing entire compl complex stories about revenge. And I still might've thought, oh, this is kind of dangerous territory. You know, this could lead to something unhealthy. Well, mm -hmm. so what I have found out since, since finishing the book, I've actually read more in the psychological literature, number one, again, confirming that it's nearly universal um, and then rarely acted upon, especially in Western cultures. And then the part that I would have never guessed, which is the idea that people seem to need to sort of work through the whole story, the fantasy, um, or, or some sort of role play. There's even been research where um, in real life where people who are considering, you know, take uh, being violent, um, you know, in, in cultures and urban cultures where there's, there's a lot of back and forth going on. But if there's a role playing where the person actually thinks about um, the judge, they, they themselves get to become the judge, the jury, the prosecutor, the defender, they see the story from all sides, then they can actually let it go. And so maybe that's what we do when we um, really intensely think about it. Maybe that's what we do when we read novels about a revenge scenario, because especially ones that have lots of different people where it's not a sadistic story, where it's really mm -hmm. seeing it from all sides and fostering empathy. And then once we've seen it from all sides, then we can actually feel like justice has been done in some way, or at least that characters have been heard, we've been heard, we've been believed and now there's some resolution. So that's something I, I, I had no idea. And even having written a novel, I still thought, oh gosh, I, I hope I'm not just encouraging vengeance, you know? And, and I think what that process taught me is that we do need to think about these things. We do need to mm -hmm. let stories guide us in some way so that we can play these things out and then think, what would I do in that situation? And then feel better because you use the word agency with the victims of mm -hmm. Countess Bathory feel like we at that point are not just victims, we are in control of the story. Mm -hmm. So that's where it all changed for me. Amazing, thank you. I'm curious to know how your family has reacted to this book. So I have one sister who has read it and she gives fantastic feedback. And so we've had many conversations about it. Um, I have another sister who is reading it now and another sister who's listening to it on audiobook now. So I might hear more from them, but. Yeah, they're definitely an important part of the story. Very cool. What would you say is the greatest gift writing this book has given you? Oh. So I talked about this sort of being able to work through all that autobiography. Um, and then there are some related issues that are pretty complicated. This, um, the person that I'm referring to as my father, I found out my mother died just a couple years ago. And then I found out that he wasn't actually my biological father. And then I had a cousin who helped me research the identity of my biological father. And then furthermore, I've actually written uh, one essay that got published about this. And as a, as a novelist, 
um, usually we don't have to sort of come out and say what parts of a story are based on us, what parts are autobiographical, and it can actually be sort of bad form to assume that. But I'm doing something different here where I'm actually coming out and saying, no, I'm admitting to you that a lot of this was informed by those experiences. So uh, I even just getting ready for a book tour, it's, it's allowed me to decide what parts I'm going to share and not share. And now I'm a lot more comfortable talking about the man I used to call dad. The, the, the person who I now know to be my biological father, um, as well as all those other psychological issues in the book. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful essay, by the way. I don't know if you want to say where it is so people could find it. Sure, it appeared in Severance Magazine online. So that was a DNA surprise story and how it actually connected to this story as well. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm wondering if we should take any questions. Are we jumping in too early to the questions? Uh, I think we can jump into questions. I'm looking at the ones that were submitted and uh, you've actually answered a oh. lot of them. <laughs> so I'm gonna pick out the ones that um, are that haven't been answered yet. This one is from Carol. If you could, what question would you most like most likely ask Annie herself? What mystery about her would you really love to know? Oh, that's such a good fun question. I would really like to know from her whether she thinks that childhood experience with the wolves made her who she was. I mean, she was just such a strong woman and so out of her time. Uh, you know, the fact that she, w she was this sharpshooter who met her husband, Frank Butler, when she was only 15, beat him in this match. And by the way, so Gail knows this is a scene she would have played in the, in the play, but in the play version, in the movie version, she throws the match. In the real story, Annie wins, which is great. And not only does Annie win the match, but her, but Frank Butler didn't mind. He was such a wonderful guy. Um, that's when their courtship began. He sent her, he gave her tickets for his show. And then he continued to court her by sending little um, notes that were signed by, with his dog's name. Okay, so that's a whole nother story. <laughs> but I, I want to tell that story because I feel defensive of Frank Butler. So I was going to sneak that story in. Um, all my previous books have had men who were pretty much scoundrels. Often they were based on real people and the real men were scoundrels. And this is the first time I've ever researched someone who actually had a wonderful egalitarian partnership, just amazing. And they died just about a week apart and were in love their whole lives. But that's not the question you asked. You asked what, what I would ask Annie. And I would ask Annie, um, did the wolves really influence her? I don't think she would tell me the truth though. I would ask her about the nature of her marriage and how she managed to have an egalitarian marriage with her husband supporting her work at a time when that never happened. And, oh shoot, I did have a third one. I would ask her uh, her views on, I still don't quite understand her views on women's suffrage and why she couldn't support women's suffrage. Yeah, that seems odd and surprising. And it's a minor one, but I would ask her about her never having children. Um, so she loved children. And she was generous. She donated lots of money later to orphan girls, which I think is wonderful. Uh, she seemed to be very friendly to her nieces. And I don't know if it was a physical thing, if it was a, a choice. So I would, I would be an, a, a journalist and I would poke at that a little bit. And ask her because, because I want to understand the time period, like how she made her choices. Yeah. yeah, I'm curious to know how you think she would react to this book if she somehow could come to our time and read it. I don't think she could make any sense of it at all. No, no, I don't think so. With the speculative part and the time travel and the psychoanalysis and no, I don't think it would have been a story for her time. I think she would have been happier with the straightforward historical fiction uh, story. And also I bet she wasn't much of a reader. So I'll also say about Annie Oakley um, because of that captivity period and her poverty, uh, she did try to get a little more education later, but she really wasn't comfortable reading or writing. She did write letters, but she wasn't very comfortable with it. So I, I don't think she would read this book. Yeah, in the play, she she I learns to read. Um, she starts out not being able to, and she she teaches herself to read. And I I loved being able to have that literacy journey with her. <laughs> That's great. That's great. That was a really fun question. That was fun. I had no shortage. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, 
I'm going to pick out one more question and then I'm going to ask you both to give out some book recommendations to our audience members. So uh, this final question is for Andromeda. What was the trickiest part of intertwining Ruth and Annie's stories in your novel? Oh, let's see. Oh, good question. And trying to come up with a simple answer. Just the, the whenever you have those different storylines, you try to flip back and forth, but you try to have them resonate and you try to not to have too much redundancy. Um, when you sort of pass the baton between different the different sections of the book, you try to make it resonant, but not too obvious at the same time. So that can be tricky. Um, I will say as a reader, I love books that do that. I love these multiple um, um, timeline books because for me, it kind of keeps the reading fresh. And then I'm also, I'm looking as a reader, I'm looking for how are these stories all going to come together? And the more complicated, the better for me. Like I really have to just trust the author and it's not going to be apparent, hopefully for the first third or first half or more of the book. And so it becomes a much more involving experience. And I know that can make for a more challenging read. But then you're really searching. You're searching for patterns. You're searching for themes. You're searching for images. And it just it, make, it makes it a richer experience in my mind. OK, so I think now is a great time to give out book re recommendations. I know both sure. of you have uh, your list, so. Yes, yes. Yeah. So especially because we know that we have some Antioch um, University MFA program uh, uh, alumni in the audience, I wanted to talk about, I was excited to talk about two different books. So one is Kate Maruyama just released a novella about, gosh, maybe just a week ago yeah. called Family Solstice. And it's a horror novella. And just as in my book, my book can't be defined, you know, too easily in terms of genre. Hers is horror. And it's definitely going to give you the creeps in a really good sense. But what I absolutely loved about it is that it has some really difficult contemporary questions. Um, and, and, and it's better to just not know too much going in, but it's going to actually get at some of the issues that are being discussed today. And that made it really fun. And I think it would be a great discussion book. So that's Kate Maruyama, Family Solstice. And then the other one is a book that is not yet published, but it's coming out March 2nd. And it's Leslie Lair, L-E-H-R. And it's a memoir called A Boob's Life. And I think I saw something about this online a long time ago before I even knew she had any connection to Antioch. And I was immediately interested because she's talking about the cultural issues of women and their breasts. And so she is writing about her experiences having breast cancer. I haven't read it yet. I'm, I've got it pre-ordered. Breast cancer. But then also just what she thought about her breasts her whole life. And then really you know, connecting it to larger cultural ideas. And I'm excited. I really want to read that book. And it has been very recently announced that it's being made into an HBO Max production with Sal Salma, Salma Hayek. Is that oh, wow. her name? Salma That's Hayek, awesome. Who said she was obsessed with the book and this is going to be Salma Hayek's first HBO uh, project. So I'm, I'm just incredibly proud of both of those writers. Um, so those are two of mine. I still have one more, but what were you going to say, Gail? Oh my goodness. Well, I, I want to call out a couple of people who are here too, and I'm so excited to read Kate's novella. I can't wait. I'm, I'm waiting for my copy, my pre-ordered copy to arrive. Um, but I have a couple of former students here who both have gorgeous novels out. I hope they're still here. Rommel and Tilkem has To the Stars Through Difficulties, which is a beautiful novel that is about libraries and books and community and is just so delightful. And Debbie Thomas, Deborah Thomas, I believe is still here, I hope. And I actually had a wonderful conversation with her at Romans um, like this a few months ago. Um, and her novel is called Luz, L-U-Z. And it's a beautiful novel about immigration, family, love. It's, it's just so, so heartwarming and, and just gorgeous. Um, so those two, I'm, I'm delighted that they're both here and I wanted to give them a call out. And another one that I just really, really loved recently was Luster by Raven Leilani, mm -hmm. which um, 
I was having a really hard time reading for a while last year. Just uh, I had presumed COVID. I had a lot of brain fog. I could read student work, but that was about it. And somehow this book just, it burned right through that fog. And it's an incredible. Um, and tell us more, what is it about? It's a novel about a young woman who gets involved with a married man. And it, things get complicated when she loses her job and can't stay in her place and ends up being invited by the man's wife to live in their home. And it's um, very uh, alive. I've heard so much about it and I've yeah, got it on my list and I it's haven't amazing. read it yet, so that'll bump it up my list. So the other book, so you mentioned about brain fog and the one other book I wanted to mention, if we have time, it looks like we do, but anyone who else has questions, you can always throw another question in there as well. Um, but the, the first book that I was able to read in the COVID era, it was April and it was Angie Kim's Miracle Creek. And I have talked about this book a couple of times because I feel so grateful to it um, because I just, I was, you know, only listening to the news and it was just, we all know, right? My, my cognition was completely different. And so I think for my entire life, I will always remember that moment of being out in my yard. It was a sunny day. The dogs were playing. It was, it was getting warmer and reading this book and realizing, oh my goodness, I could actually read for 20 minutes and, and sustain focus. And uh, so, so Miracle Creek, it's a mystery, it's a courtroom drama, but then it also has issues of immigration. There's a Korean family, um, so that assimilation into American society. And then there's some health issues and parenting issues as well, because it's about um, people that are getting treatments in this hyperbaric chamber. So there's health, there's immigration, all these things. And the mystery side of it, I think, is what made it possible for me to get pulled in. And then, it, and then it was layered with all these other things. And I was, I don't know about you, Gail, but I was at that point that I think we reach somewhat regularly where we ask ourselves as writers, you know, what is the point of this? What is the point of story? What's the point of a novel? Especially when journalism and the news, when that's all taking over, like, why are we doing this? And I just felt so incredibly grateful to her and I kept thinking that when we talk about things as being escapist, how that's really way too simplistic because it was, it was a form of escape. It was getting me out of my own head that I was so sick of, but it was also teaching me all these other things about immigration, about the Korean American experience. So it was not shallow in any way. And it made me feel ready to not only read more books, but to get back into writing again. That's wonderful. So how are you, since we still have time, how is your writing going now? Um, it's, it's coming along. I, I feel like I finally have that writing energy back, which was, you know, it was very tamped down for much of last year. It was hard to find voice. I wasn't sure I'd ever write another book again, wow. um, which was a weird feeling. Um, you know, writing has been so important to me my whole life and it just That's made really me big feel really um disoriented and yeah it was it was confusing to me but um i yeah I'm so when writing. you say you thought you might not write a book again was that because of your health issues as well like all of it or or what the world was going through it was a little bit of everything i wasn't sure i was going to survive for a while i there were nights where i was having so much trouble breathing i wasn't sure i would wake up the next morning oh um which was scary and so there was that but then also there was just this weird um i don't know quietude inside of me that made me feel like you know maybe i've said everything i need to say <laughs> and um yeah but then things started percolating again and uh, yeah. And would it be appropriate to ask you what you're working on or is it just not quite time yet? Um, well, I'm, I'm working on a few things. I, I'm getting excited about short stories again, which after a long time, which is really fun. Um, I'm working on a new book about writing. Uh, yes. Uh, is there a name for it yet? Write Like an Animal. Okay, great. Well, that's an amazing thing that you said you went almost from the point of feeling like you said everything you were going to say and weren't going to write again to working on a book about writing. That's a big leap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's fun. It's a book I've actually been wanting to write ever since my book Fruit Flesh, which is a book about writing came out, which came out in 2002, so almost 20 years ago. 
<laughs> um, and uh, I'm finally working on it. So, so that's great fun. That's great. You mentioning that reminds me. So I'm also a book coach. And one thing that has been really inspiring to me this year, um, I've actually, my book coaching has expanded because more people have come to me with manuscripts, a lot of memoirists, but also fiction. But um, some people have had trouble writing during this era and some people have written way more and their stories have been incredibly impressive to me, especially when you watch somebody revise a book and it just gets so much better. I think we as writers, you're just so inside the process, you're the fish in the water and you can't see how your work is evolving. But when you see it with a student or a client, then yeah. you actually, again, believe not only in the story when they're sharing personal stories, lifetimes of experience, but then you believe in the revision process as well. And I, I really feel like in a sense that saves me as a writer. I don't, I don't wish that I just could afford to never teach or coach again because it recharges me as well. I agree. And it's wonderful to see former students here. It's super exciting. And I'd love to, you know, if you like to talk about what you're working on. So <laughs> I know I asked you the question, right? I actually, so I have another um, manuscript that's done and going on on submission soon. And it's actually a thriller and it's set in Guatemala. It's a story of a mother investigating the mysterious death of her daughter. And it was based on a research trip. I actually went to Guatemala and that it was a fun book to write. I guess, again, that's the word I keep coming back to after having written for 30 years. My first novel came out in 20, 2007. It was a blast to write and it wrote itself very quickly. And, um, and that was wonderful. And also I, I, then the revisions were slower. The first draft was fast, the revisions have been slow, but it's been allowing me to travel. So getting to go back to those Guatemala scenes, um, that's hard for me because a lot of my research or a lot of my novels involve travel and research. Mm -hmm. And I've had other projects that actually have been set aside because I can't do the research travel component. Like I had one that I needed to go to a South Pacific Island which sounded fantastic. Yeah. And then I didn't do the research. I didn't go there. And um, so I'm, I'm hoping to pick that one up again, but it's harder without the travel. I hope so. Yeah. And I, I'm so glad that both of us are having fun with the process again, after writing such difficult books, right. I, I had forgotten <laughs> how much fun writing could be. And, and it's really a joy to, to be able to find joy <laughs> in the process. I agree. I think that's a good place to uh, wrap it. Uh, thank you, Andromeda. Thank you, Gail. That was such like a lovely conversation. And thank you for the lovely uh, book recommendations. Thank, uh, you. thank you to everyone who tuned in and uh, participated in the chat. It was great to see everyone's thoughts. Um, again, if you would like to purchase a copy of Annie and the Wolves, just click on the green purchase button. It'll take you to our website where you can complete your purchase. And also for those who tuned in late, don't worry, uh, a recording of this talk will be available, um, I think within about an hour. Uh, just use the same stream link and you'll be able to rewatch the talk. And I think that about does it. Uh, stay safe, everyone, and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.